Today, I wanna show you guys how to produce big anthemic singer-songwriter pop, similar to artists like Dean Lewis, James Arthur, and Louis Capaldi. And I'm gonna show you that by breaking down a track that I did for Father Jonah called Like a Fool, and it sounds like this. Just so you can break me again and So yeah, I'll just jump into it. Quick plug for myself. Uh, I do produce music under the name Velvet Ear as a freelancer. So if you watch this video and you think we would have fun working on a project together, check out the link at the top of my description below. First thing I wanna look at are the vocals. This is actually pretty light for me. When I do indie pop, I'm normally adding like a ton of doubles, a ton of harmonies, a ton of doubles for those harmonies. With this sort of like softer singer songwriter acoustic style, every time I referenced songs that did this style really well, they always had like one main vocal and maybe a couple of things that would come in every once in a while but for the most part it was just one vocal so the main vocal sounds like this and never chaos us. it clipped a little bit here but i, I kind of I'm, I'm gonna be honest i kind of liked it it added like a cool little grit to it i know that technically it shouldn't be clipping but i liked it so we kept it but yeah in terms of my vocal chain this is a variation of the chain that i've used like several times over i'll bring it over here so you can see it but it normally starts with an eq high pass filter a little bit of a cut in like the 100 to 150 range and then a bit of a high boost let me turn off everything so you can hear what it's doing so this is dry with the eq and never chaos using some virtual mix rack and never chaos really driving the preamp here because I felt like earlier in the song, it can be kind of soft, but I knew that when we got to this part where it was louder, I really wanted it to be like driving that preamp. And honestly, driving the preamp here kind of masks the fact that it's like clipping digitally a little bit, like the digital distortion of like the preamp clipping and the analog clipping that's happening here on the channel strip, they sort of blend together and they sort of mask each other a little bit. I'll use a different section here. I'll let you back. Back in. But yeah, using a de-esser, a little bit of a Neve style EQ for broad stroke stuff. Then a VCA going into a distressor. And break me. Going into a Lindel de-esser. I feel like de-essing is the thing that I'm normally doing the most after the fact if I don't do it right at the beginning. So yeah, there's a couple of de-essers. All the chaos you caused us. It just tames it and keeps it from getting harsh. A little bit of Arvox on top of that. And break me again just to round it out this was one song where i went kind of crazy with notching frequencies i don't really do this that much but i still think that it sounded good on this track in break me again just some bands dynamically pulling down like resonant frequencies in the vocal that i feel like poke out a little bit too much a little bit of mott to round it out in break me Again. Near the end of the chain, I used some SBL twin tube. I think I was struggling to get the vocal to stand out from the rest of the mix. So I threw twin tube on it and it looks like I was boosting harmonics in like the 3K range. In break me. And then uh, a little bit of micro shift. I normally use this on the lead vocal to just get it a, a tiny bit wider. You can see it's like barely on at all, but just get a little bit of width out of the main vocal. In break me. And then we have this Fab Filter Pro Q on this uh, phone preset that I actually love a lot. And I just automate this EQ on and off at different sections for just this little ad lib here. Maybe it will, and maybe it won't. Just because I felt like that was more of an ad lib than a main vocal take, but I didn't feel like duplicating the whole chain over and adding that one EQ just for that one moment. And then another thing that I think was really important was here you can see there's this gain utility. There were multiple points in the song where words were either too loud or not loud enough, and you just kind of have to automate them up and down. It was mainly here for this section just because it's like significantly louder from this point forward compared to the rest 
rest of the song. And then in terms of effects, we're using a few of them here. We have some Valhalla Vintage Verb. We have some ROM from Native Instruments. We have some Valhalla Delay. With a little bit of a ducking going on. And then I really felt like the vocal needed to like fill itself out in certain sections, like where it would like pop up. So what I have here on one of the sends is this Valhalla ducking delay. And you'll hear it like really ducks. Listen to it here. Like it really jumps up in volume. I know it's weird, but it just kind of felt right throwing it into a reverb. It has this like almost like delayed reverb swell that like sort of jumps into the vocal after it's done. Oh, felt like it was really cool because it added almost like a the way like Post Malone, if you listen to a vocal track from him, it's always a main vocal and then some other like really subdued vocal that's like filling in any empty space. And you can see all of the effects I just mentioned have their own automation and they're going up and down at different sections. You can see here we wanted different swells up at the end of certain lines. Ooh, I'll let you back in. And I think that's probably the biggest thing I would take away from this genre is you really need to treat your main vocal as the star of the show, because that is sort of like, in my opinion, the essence of like what makes singer songwriter pop different from just like regular pop stuff. You're not really hiding your main vocal behind a bunch of other vocal layers. You're really using one take and getting as much bang for your buck as you can get out of it. And then at some other points in the song, we have some harmonies. Just some really verbed out stuff that honestly, it's not too prominent compared to the rest of the vocal. And honestly, I wish they never would have. Like it's more of like a gospel, like you're in a church and there's somebody really close to you and then there's like some other singers behind them just for like a few words. I think for this style, the next most important aspect would be the acoustic guitars. So with these guys, I was intentional not to make them very bright and not have them swallow up too much of the low end. I feel like when you get into this style, you need to view it as like a high production track. And if there's anything you learn really quickly about like mixing acoustic guitars is that they tend to scoop up all of like the low end and low mid range of a track. And so you really need to be careful that you're not stepping on the toes of all the other production elements you're gonna be adding underneath it, which I'll show you later. But yeah, honestly with these guys i just kind of wanted to really dirty them up so i'm using kramer's master tape i'm using a little bit of rc20 a little bit of an eq curve to correct them here and then some soothe to really tame like some of the harsher stuff that's happening so if i turn off all of this stuff you'll hear what i'm talking about kramer tape rc20 Like you can hear it's almost taming like the really harsh stuff that's in the acoustic. Like I'm not really doing like the normal like singer songwriter thing where you're just like, okay, how high fidelity can we get this acoustic guitar sound? And you're trying to get more of a vibe and something that's like interesting to the listener, something that has a little bit more character to it. So in terms of layers, I have these two, which are like my main layers. Both of those are recorded with my Yamaha, which is like, I don't know, like the $500 Yamaha. Through this guy, this is an AKG P170. I really like the sound of a small pencil condenser microphone really close to the neck on an acoustic. I feel like most of the issues that people run into with mixing acoustic guitars in this style, where it's like really eating a lot of the low end and the lower mid range can kind of be tamed by just using like a smaller diaphragm microphone that's not picking up as much low end. For the chain, they are both going into some EQs, which is here at the front. After that, it's going into an optical compressor. Yeah. 
that first EQ and that compressor are almost meant to like replicate if you were tracking an acoustic guitar through like an analog signal chain. Like if you were in a studio, it's like, okay, let's plug this into the preamp and then do a little bit of compression baked in. And then this is the actual like processing chain. So I just take my standard virtual mix rack strip. And then another thing I use is on C4, which is a multiband compressor. This tamed guitars preset is uh, awesome because it really helps control the like woofiness that like pops out of the mid range of a guitar, but it also looks at like this low end stuff and the pick attack. So. It just really helps tame things, I guess. We have double tracked left and right. And then we have this guy here in the middle. I think it was basically the same guitar and mic setup. I think I just voiced the chords a little bit higher. But yeah, you can see with the EQ curve with this, I was not worried about like keeping the main sound of the acoustic intact. I was pretty okay with bending it over backwards a little bit because I wanted it to fit more as like a production layer in a song that had an acoustic feel. I wasn't trying to produce a song around an acoustic guitar. Um, same mixing chain and everything. Also, I have separate effects sends for my instruments and my vocals. So these red ones are for my vocals and these blue ones are for my instruments. And yeah, basically the same like Valhalla vintage verb, a ROM reverb. I normally try to keep like the elements of my reverbs the same. I basically just like to duplicate what I use for my instruments onto a separate group of sends and then use those for my main vocal. Just because I feel like I'm always trying to like finagle the vocals in a way that's specific. And it's just, I end up bending one group of ascend too much towards either not catering to the vocals or catering to the instrumentals or stuff like that. But yeah. Then we have our pads, which sound insane. I'm scared to unfreeze them if I'm being honest right now because there's a lot going on with them. But yeah, let's pray for the best. So the first one we have here is this guy on the top. which I think is the most important one. And it's actually pretty simple. It is a guitar going into this like almost clean preset on guitar rig. So it sounds like this. And that is going into emergence, which is a really crazy granular effect, which. There's multiple grains that it's grabbing and it's panning them to the left and the right and then also pitching them up in octave and since they're like non-linear like it's not like quarter notes or eighth notes they're set in milliseconds there's just this really weird texture that it adds and then there's a little bit of reversing going on and then that is running into Valhalla Supermassive on this uh, We Are Stardust preset. It's just this really cool, like floaty texture. And then I have another instance of that just below it, playing something slightly different. So I would say those two pads are a majority of the texture of the track. I also have this tremolo strings going in contact, which if I turn off all the effects, sounds like this. And then I bandpass it throw it into a little bit of space modulator. I also have this little drone that I made. I recorded like some some takes of me just randomly rubbing stuff together. So it's literally just like me holding a rosary and I threw it into Ableton's resonator, which allows you to pick specific resonant frequencies out of the signal that you're running through it and it kind of boosts them. So you hear it's like weird rhythmic thing happening, but it's also like almost like a pad going on. And so then I high passed that and then ran that into some Valhalla Vintage Verb. 
there's just a weird like percussive feel that it adds to it, but it's also like chordal and it doesn't have like the same vibe as if you were to add like a drum hit or like add something that had like really harsh transients to it. It's almost a mixture between like a vocoder and a shaker. I don't know. It's really fun. We then have another electric basically playing the same thing that this pad was playing, but uh, it's not completely verbed out. And then we have this low piano here. which is the gentleman inside of contact going into some tube compression and a little bit of virtual mix rack. And I'm really tr not trying to get it to like do what a piano does where it like reaches super down low because when a piano reaches down like that low and you're using like big fat octaves, you are in the same range as a bass. And so if you just kind of let that go through, you're going to have it interfering with your bass a lot. So I just wanted like the mid range texture of that. So I high passed it pretty aggressively. We also have the same piano basically acting as like another pad going into Valhalla Supermassive. Yeah, so this song gave me a chance to like really lean in on my love for pads and reverb. Um, but then we should go to the bass, which sounds like this. Which you can hear is a really low like synth Synthetic bass. And I don't mean that as like a, another way of saying the word synth. I mean like it's not something like an acoustic bass or a double bass that you would see like an orchestra. Like this is really going into like the subs of the track and it's really just keeping the note in the middle. It's not wavering at all. And I feel like when you build a track like this, it's really important to have like the bass not be like super wobbly and just be like unapologetic. Like this is the note. But then on top of that, you can add other layers that make it a little bit more interesting so we have this guy which is the same thing but an octave up and so when you play them together you can get the bass to like pop out a little bit more i noticed that when i don't do like this doubling thing with really low basses um they can tend to disappear on people's phones a lot we then have a string section going on here Nothing crazy. I'm just using contacts orchestral, just have double bass, some cellos, and I believe some violas. Yeah, some violas. I didn't feel like it was necessary to add violins on top of this because everything was already like super wide and there were enough elements like reverbs or things like that that were reaching up into that higher range. But yeah, again, I'm not really trying to like preserve, quote unquote, all of like the natural string tones of it. I'm trying to use it as like a texture instrument and there's a lot of EQ, a lot of OTT. And in a lot of just trying to control it. It's almost like I'm trying to make it like a nugget of mid range that I can just sort of raise up where I want it and then just pull it back down. String people have every right to be mad at me for doing that, but I just feel like that's the best way to use it in this style. And then we go to the drums, which are pretty much all at the end, which sound like this. So there's a few elements that are really cool here. First are these like sort of Foley things that I did. Which if I turn off all the processing, they're just like random Foley sounds, but when you throw them through like a really steep band pass EQ, and then you use something like pan flow to like make it pan between the left and the right over a long period of time. Like if you look at this, it's like a four on the speed, so. So those ads are this like cool, like wavering motion, which makes the instrumental a little bit more interesting than just like kick and snare. But speaking of which, this is actually a kick drum I made. Do not ask me how I made it. I made it forever ago. I do not remember what I did, but it's like a very pillowy soft kick drum that still has a lot of low end. Underneath that, we have a couple of different snare drums going on at the same time. 
So first one we have is from the Solid Slate Drums 5. Just a basic brush kit to get the sort of like loose feel of it. And then underneath that, I just threw in like the default contact snare drum. Just to try to like add a bunch of like different note variations because you can hear like when you play different notes or different pitches, it can really help keep it from sounding like it's like the same snare sample or the same snare instrument over and over again. So I think I tried both of them to see which one was better and I ended up just liking both of them combined. You get the sort of like waftiness of the brushes, but you also get like the note variation of the snare. We then have multiple toms. Which are all pre-mixed drums. I'm still in Superior Drummer 2.0. Don't come at me. But I'm actually using an Easy X inside of Superior Drummer. So this isn't even Superior Drummer. This is basically Easy Drummer, the old version. But uh, yeah, this rock solid Easy X has some really good toms in it. But yeah, I just took a bunch of them and just panned them differently to try to get these big hits. You can also see I like went in and like performed each tom all on its own to try to get them like staggered like this. Like you don't want them all hitting at the same time. You want the sort of feel of like a big drum line of people like adding their hits to the kick that's already going. And then the last thing were the effects, which there weren't really a lot, if I'm being honest. We have our go to clap impact. But then we also have some samples and risers from the Paul Mabry kit for that sound, which are these more like swelled up cymbals. In my opinion, those are like the samples that still like digital kits can't really emulate. The best thing you can do if you need something like that is just try to find a sample of somebody performing that on a live cymbal and just fly it into your track. Because yeah, the amount of times that I've tried to do it digitally and it just, it doesn't work. When you have a cymbal that you're hitting multiple times, there's like this billowing factor that it has when it washes up and you ramp into it. And like a multi-sampled kit where it's just triggering a bunch of individual samples, it kind of can't do that. Like it can re-trigger multiple hits or different variations like soft and quiet hits with different round robins but it can't get like the big rolling motion of one symbol just whoosh. but yeah that's everything and so when you put all that stuff together it sounds like this just so you can break me again and But yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. If you did, go check out Like a Fool. It's on streaming platforms right now. Again, thank you to Jonah for letting me produce this. This was genuinely really fun. I don't get to do this style that often, but it's, it's really fun to just nerd out over reverbs and bats for like a week. But yeah, if you enjoyed this video, hit like, subscribe, all that stuff below. I actually have a Discord channel where I'm uploading weekly micro tutorials. That is stuff that I can't feature on this YouTube channel just because it's so small that I can't talk about it. But yeah, there's still a lot of good stuff that I want to talk about. But yeah, I will see you guys next week.